The gentleman from California, Vice Chair Gomez, is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so January 6th is um, something that I think none of us will ever forget, especially if um, we were in the Capitol that day, which I was, or especially uh, my colleagues and myself who were stuck in the gallery. Um, not only because um, we were stuck while everybody else was evacuated, um, we also had to crawl on the ground so you know we wouldn't get shot or something would happen. We, um, that is something that I will never forget. And I'm still extremely, extremely angry about that day. And I know we're talking about intelligence failures and there's been a lot. Um, but I had constituents who came up to me and asked me, they're like, hey, are you concerned that they're going to try to, uh, Trump supporters and QAnon uh, followers are going to try to stop uh, the certification of the Electoral College? And I was like, no, no, no. We have Capitol Police, we have FBI. If, if we hear something or if they heard something, if we would get notice. I'm not concerned about that. But these white nationalists, literally planned this insurrection and played in sight. My own constituents were following it along and warning me. My chief of staff tried to warn me, even a few days earlier. But I thought, FBI, right? They're going to they're know. But there wasn't a threat assist assessment, no intelligence bulletin. And how can you prepare if there wasn't something of that sort? Yes, I heard the testimony from the director that he gave uh, there was raw data that was given through the Capitol Police. But I still, uh, Director Ray, the F FBI claims it didn't produce a bulletin over First Amendment concerns. Do you consider threats against elected officials and an assault on the Capitol to be free speech? Jen, I, what I would say is that we produced a dozen plus intelligence products on domestic violent extremism, specifically geared towards the elections and protests related to the elections over the course of 2020, right on up to and leading to and including the month uh, right before January 6th, in addition to the, uh, the raw intelligence or the raw information that we just described. So we were producing a fair amount of information warning about the potential for violence, about the potential for violence among protests, among the potential for violence amid partisan uh, political rallies let, uh, let me, related to the election and right on up to let, past reclaim, election day. Let me, the let me reclaim my time. The Senate report from the Homeland Security and Rules Committee said neither the Department of Homeland Security nor the FBI issued a threat assessment or joint intelligence bulletin to the January 6th joint session of Congress to count the Electoral College votes a bulletin specific to that day, which my own constituents were mentioning. They're, they don't work for the FBI. You know, some of them are just, you know, school teachers, but they knew it. Why didn't you issue a threat assessment or a bulletin specifically regarding June 6th? Normally when we issue a formal threat assessment, it, uh, which is something we don't do all the time, but it's something that is tied to a, an event where there's a whole process where something is designated a national special event, an NSSE, kind of like the inauguration is. And it's planned months in advance by the Department of Homeland Security, designates the event, and then we are asked to provide a formal threat assessment in relation to that event. For the rest of the year, 365 days a year, we're producing intelligence products all the time, and we did here as well both the, the finished intelligence products about domestic violent extremism and about the potential for violence related to the election, including past the election day itself, all the way up through the inauguration. But you and in addition to that, the raw information that we've but already you discussed did not in this issue a, a intelligence bulletin, a threat assessment for January 6th. People were gathering with gallows, gallows, right? And you didn't issue a threat assessment. Here's the, let me ask you this. If you had to do over again, would you have issued a threat assessment at, or an intelligence bulletin for January 6th? Well, yes or no? 
Very Certainly, if we, if we knew all the information that we've developed in our investigations before January 6, we would have built an intelligence product uh, based on that yeah. and provided, uh, provided it to all sorts of people. Well, let me just point out that you, an intelligence bulletin was just issued regarding QAnon followers being upset that their prophecies are not going to be uh, coming to fruition. So when it comes to the real threat that occurred leading up to January 6th, I think it was a failure of, of taking that seriously to acting and it put not only members' lives in danger, especially the ones that don't have security, but also our democracy in danger. With that, I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocate for the superiority of the white race. That is an absolute flat out lie. It is not our greatest threat. Not once in his speech today did Merrick Garland mention last summer's BLM riots or skyrocketing crime on our streets, the riots we still see week in and week out. How about Merrick Garland? You condemn this man on your screen, Justin Tyran Roberts, arrested for shooting five people in a 20-hour shooting spree in Georgia over the weekend. You know why he did it, according to investigators? They insist he was intentionally targeting white, military-looking men. That sounds racially motivated to me. He didn't mention that. No mention of this black-on-white crime because it doesn't fit their divisive narrative. These are stories that are actually happening in America. How about we stop issuing fake warnings about crime based off of political agendas and start prosecuting all criminals, no matter what color they are? When you're up there, are you just getting tired of being told you're a racist, I'm a racist, everybody watching is a racist? Yeah. They have to talk about January 6th, and they have to talk about things that divide us on, uh, along racial grounds. It is, it is so wrong. But that's who the Democrats are today. They're this radical left-wing party, and they have nothing else positive to talk about, so they have to go here. Yeah. You know, you look at January 6th. Everybody has said it was a tragic day. It never should have yep. happened. They wanted people that were violent and destructive put away. But, you know, I was looking at Senator Ron Johnson. He looked at hours and hours and hours of tapes, and he was like something like 40 percent of the people were just let in by Capitol Police but they don't talk about any of that. And you have SWAT teams showing up in California at somebody's house, trying to rouse them out of the house for walking around taking selfies inside that Capitol. It isn't right, Congressman. Or how about the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol? I mean, look, you're right. We Republicans have been, conservatives have been consistent. We condemned the violence that took place on January 6th, and we condemned all of it that took place all last summer with all these, uh, in all these metropolitan areas around our, around our great country. The Democrats are the ones who have been hip hypocrites on this. They did, they, last summer was fine. That was a righteous cause. But then they focused on, on January 6th. But the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol, the FBI kicks in their door, holds them at gunpoint, handcuffs them, interrogates them for four hours. They got the wrong couple. And then they take their phones, their laptop, and their pocket-sized copy of the Constitution. Talk about, I mean, that, that, there's got to be irony in that, that, that fact alone. So, yeah, the, the, where's the consistency that we would like from everyone? We've been consistent. I wish the Democrats would do the same. Yeah. Well, there's my pocket constitution. I carry it with me all over the place. And I'm in Texas, Congressman. Come and take it. Usually we're talking about guns. This time I'm talking about my constitution. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocate for the superiority of the white race. Garland did not provide any numbers or statistics to back up this claim, but pointed to past racially motivated shootings and attacks, as well as the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. 
Noticeably, Garland spent his entire 26-minute speech without even mentioning the summer of riots one time, simply ignoring months of attacks on police and federal buildings and cities all across this country as if it just didn't happen. Steve, I think this shows how politicized Biden's DOJ has really become ignoring vi radical violent groups like Antifa, like BLM, simply because they support the left-wing agenda. Yeah, unfortunately, it's another example of two sets of rules or two sets of narratives, really, in a way. And the narrative being spread here, of course, is that that January 6 is uh, was a, a riot that somehow endangered the American Republic, which is not in any sense true. It was an unarmed riot, inexcusable for to be sure, but unarmed. No, not one person has been charged with having a firearm inside the Capitol that day, and it lasted a few hours. To try to compare that to weeks of rage and carnage ap across the summer last year in 2020 um, is just totally ludicrous and illogical. Unfortunately, that's right where Merrick Garland went. They're essentially pitting America Americans against one another by labeling it via basically a race war, which is essentially what they're implying with that statement. And I don't agree with it. And I think it's absolutely horrifying to see that you have the DOG, DOJ essentially being weaponized against the American people. There was, a, there was a rally in Chicago of white supremacists on January 25th. And they put out a national call and they got 80 people to show up in Chicago. And according to one expert, five people were from the Chicago area. Out of about, what, eight or nine million people who live in Chicago, there were five people, right? And so a lot of this uh, the southern, the relies on the Southern Poverty Law Center and the statistics that they put out and the media regurgitate that. And so I think we have to be careful. Certainly, I, I do not trust the media uh, on this issue because they, they have proven themselves to be uh, you know, not reliable when it comes to being partisan and pushing certain narratives. So um, is white supremacy... Is there some in the United States? Absolutely. Is it the most uh, biggest threat to, to America? I think that's overblown. And I think that the administration is pushing it for their own political reasons. You know, it seems to me that race relations in America in recent decades have improved so dramatically that things like, for example, interracial marriages are totally unremarkable in America today. Uh, and it is not considered acceptable in polite society at all to have racist views. And yet we have people like Garland and Joe Biden who want to insist that the country is systemically racist. Are they essentially protesting a struggle that has already been won in American culture? You know, there has been tremendous progress in this country. And, and for a lot of folks uh, on the left to, to, as they're saying now, this is, you know, voting rights, it's Jim Crow 2.0, that there's been no progress made since the 1960s or even the 1860s. I mean, that, most Americans understand that's ludicrous. I mean, that is gaslighting, right? That is an absolute gaslighting right. of the American people. And so I think, uh, again, in our normal everyday lives, we do not see the bogeymen that are being made out. There are not Klansmen walking around the corner. There are not white supremacists uh, gathering on street corners. And so I think, uh, you know, that ultimately falls flat to the American people because that's not what we see and we live in our day-to-day -day lives. Right. And we understand that racism is really, uh, you know, has, has been a thing of the past. I mean, does it still exist today? Sure it does in certain areas. But is the, is the country systemically racist and oppressive? I don't think most people believe that.